All right. So I made chocolate for my capstone. Um, I wanted to do something that would get me like a physical uh, end product, but I also wanted to like, I don't know, have an interesting process. So I did some basic research and I decided to make, try and make a chocolate bar out of a cacao pod, which is how it starts. Um, so my first big research question was what is chocolate? There we go. <laughs> um, so chocolate starts out as cacao pods, which are grown on trees in the tropics within 10 degrees of the equator. Um, they look like that. They're pretty cool. Um, and the beans are taken out of those. They have a lot of like sweet pulp around them. And they're stuck in those big wooden boxes to ferment. So basically, the natural yeast in the air um, eats the pulp and produces ethanol, which reacts, as, which reacts with the oxygen to make acetic acid, which like transforms the flavor of the beans. Um, so once they're done fermenting, which is usually about like four or five days, they're dried in the sun, and then they are packed up and shipped to processing facilities in like Europe and North America usually. Um, then the beans are roasted to help with the flavor as well. And they are cracked and winnowed, which is basically just a fancy word for deshelling the beans. So there's just a little coating um, that you can take off of them with a fancy machine or just by hand. Um, and this is like super important because all the moisture needs to come out of the cacao beans so that they um, they, there's no moisture in the chocolate when you um, begin the um, more technical chocolate process, because if there is, the chocolate will see. So it turns from a nice, like, smooth consistency into a grainy, hard mass that is unsalvageable. So that's really not good. Um, and so I had to be careful about not getting water um, in my chocolate. Um, and so once you have the beans in their crushed, roasted state, um, these are called cacao nibs, then you can do a bunch of different things with them. You, this is, you alkalize them to make cocoa powder, or you can leave them as is for nibs. Um, this is when usually you start referring things start referring to things as cocoa instead of cacao. So it's just a more processed version. Um, and I decided to make a chocolate bar. So after this, the process is unique to the chocolate bar. Um, so first they are refined in a special machine. Um, this right up here, you can see, this is called a wet grinder. So it's just where stones are grinding against a stone plate and it just breaks up the particle size so small that you can't feel any graininess in your mouth so it feels smooth when you um, eat it um, and there are other kinds too like ball mills which just have little balls that grind against each other um, and then conching happens so these machines will just run with no force between the stones so it's just basically mixing for a long time and this volatilizes, volatilizes the acetic acid that's in the chocolate so it loses like a sour taste um, and it just becomes a lot more pleasant flavor and then the last few steps are tempering and molding um, tempering is a kind of finicky process um, where you heat the chocolate up and then cool it down and heat it up again to certain temperatures so that you align the cocoa butter crystal, crystals, that's just the fat in the chocolate, in a certain way so that there are some desired properties that happen. Um, so as you can see, the tempered chocolate on the right is shiny and smooth, and if you break it, it's like snappy, um, and it's not doesn't like melt to your touch. Whereas the chocolate on the left is untempered, untempered so it's more dull. Um, it 
doesn't break as nicely and it doesn't look as good. That stuff on the surface is called bloom, just as when the fat separates from the rest of the chocolate a little bit. And uh, the thing that chocolate makers like about tempered chocolate so much is it has, it's just the most uh, stable shelf life. It, um, because it's not really affected by the, by room temperature, it's not gonna melt or, and also it's just more pleasant to look at. So once the chocolate is tempered, it's poured into molds and those are cooled and then those are released and you hopefully have your final chocolate. So my first big uh, step was research and preparation. I did most of my research through YouTube, lots of videos. There's a few channels that were steps that put me through the steps of chocolate making, um, everything I needed to know. So that was super helpful. Um, and I learned the materials that I needed through YouTube. So he ordered this chocolate refiner. Um, I reached out to some chocolate making companies around here and ones that are farther away, but either people didn't respond or because of COVID they were uh, shut down. So that was not so successful, um, but I just, I figured I could figure out everything on YouTube and that ended up working out pretty well. I also researched during this time while the refining the refiner was coming. I researched sustainability and ethics and history of chocolate, which I don't really have time to get into, but they're pretty interesting and there are lots of issues within the chocolate industry that people are working on and that are not so good. So my first step was tempering. I just was doing this as some practice because I heard that this process was pretty difficult. So I tried two different methods. I tried the double boiler method, which is where a bowl of chocolate is put over some boiling water and the steam just heats it up and you monitor that temperature with a, uh, just a thermometer. Um, and I was actually pretty successful with that first attempt. As you can see the top right picture, it's pretty shiny and it snapped really nicely and there's no bloom. So I was pretty pleased with that. But I also wanted to try the sous vide method. So my dad had this sous vide machine. It's basically just monitors the temperature of the water and it can control it. So I vacuum sealed the chocolate in a bag and just adjusted the temperature of the water as needed. And that was what uh, tempered the chocolate. But both times I did this, it was not very successful. As you can see, there's a lot of bloom on that middle right photo and the bottom right one is just really dull and it didn't snap well. Um, I think that's because it was hard to mix the chocolate in, a ba in the bag, so I didn't get to break up the cocoa butter crystals as well as I did when I was mixing it by hand. So I ditched that and decided to use the double boiler method. Um, so the chocolate refiner came, it looks like that. Um, it was just kind of a mini version of the other one we saw with small stones. I think they're granite grinding against the bottom stone. Um, and so what I did is I took, I bought some cacao nibs from the store and I first pre-ground those in a food processor and then I added them slowly and heated them with a blow dryer just to um, speed up the process. Eventually they turned into that second picture so it's nice and liquid. All the fat is like released from the nibs. And so that was when I added the sugar. Um, I also pre-ground that in a blender just to make things go faster. Um, and then I, uh, so I ended up doing a 70%, about a 70% um, dark chocolate which just refers to the percent of chocolate that is like cocoa mass, so the cocoa nibs basically. Um, and the other stuff is sugar in my case, but also for like commercial chocolate bars, there's like preservatives and, you know, milk chocolate has milk powder and stuff. So I refined this for 24 hours and then I conched for about five hours. So I just released the tension of that knob at the top and there was no uh, grinding happening, it was just mixing. And uh, that 
I, I decided that was good enough, so I went on to tempering. I poured the chocolate through a sieve just to catch any chunks of the refiner might have missed. Then I tempered using a double boiler, and it ended up, I poured it into the mold, it ended up with this final product, which, as you can see, has a lot of bloom. So I was not super pleased with that, but it did have better snap and shine. So that was a plus. Um, and the taste itself was good, but the aftertaste was not so good. Um, yeah, I uh, retasted it the other day. and It's not very good, but I realized I just probably didn't conch for long enough. So I just didn't let it mix for long enough afterwards because it was it had that sour taste that the videos described. Um, so then I ordered the cacao pods for my final uh, my final chocolate making because I felt mm, comfortable with the equipment and process. So I got these through a company that's based in Miami, and they actually came pretty fast, so that was good. These were really interesting just because I'd never seen anything like them before. They smelled really tropical, and they were really slimy, but they, um, they, the pulp was really sweet. I just like tasted it because supposedly like people just will suck on the beans and just suck the pulp off. So it actually tasted pretty good. Um, and I put these in those fermenting baskets on the right. So we just had like dumpling steamers and I lined them with banana leaves um, to ferment these. Um, so the fermentation process did not go as I had planned. It took a lot longer than I was expecting, probably because it was a much cooler environment than the tropics um, where they're normally fermented in a much smaller quantity. But as you can see, the progression, they did, the pulp did get eaten by the yeast in the air, um, but it didn't develop that reddish brown color that ideal fermentation has on the top left. Um, but I decided I didn't really have any time to spare, so I was just going to call it good enough. Um, and so I put them in the dehydrator because the sun obviously is not strong enough here to just dry those in April. So um, I had my dried fermented cacao beans, even though they weren't exactly what, um, what they were supposed to look like. I figured it would be good enough. So then I roasted them. There we go, thank you. Um, I roasted them according to the instructions of one of the videos I found. Um, and then they started to look a lot more like um, standard cacao beans. So as you can see, there's a little shell on the outside. And that was pretty easy to get off just by like crushing the bean and the shell would come off. Um, it was a little time consuming, but not that bad um, once I had let them cool. So from here, I was ready for my final few steps. Um, so I, again, followed the same steps as before. I pre-ground the nibs, added them. This time I used a heat gun. I found that we had a heat gun in the garage. And that was a little bit easier um, to use. So uh, yeah, the same process happened, but instead of conching for five hours, I conched for a whole 24 hours. And I just tasted the chocolate out of there and it was a lot better. So I was feeling good about this. Um, and I tempered these again using the double boiler method. And then I ended with these nice shiny bars that I was really pleased with the temper. There is a little bit of bloom on them, as you can see, but I thought it looked in a cool pattern. And I didn't want to temper again because <laughs> it was annoying. So uh, I left it like that. And I ended up with eight bars plus a little bit more. Um, and I brought some. It's prepared COVID safe. It's been sealed in a bag for six days. So it should be totally fine if you guys want to take some or if you have any questions first. Thank you. Chocolate? <laughs> Yeah? Um, I didn't have much time to talk about the, the 
Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if you had any comments about that. Yeah, the um, chocolate in, so chocolate came from like Central America, that's where it originated, and all the ancient Mesoamerican um, cultures used chocolate in some form, but it was all like a drink form. Um, and then once the Spanish colonized Latin America, they brought chocolate back to Europe with them and they still drank it as a drink, but they also added sugar. Um, and eventually during like the industrial revolution, there were inventors that were just trying to make it more like marketable. Um, so people invented ways to um, grind them and then like add certain products like milk powder to create the chocolate bars that we know today, I guess that's short inversion yeah yeah does chocolate come from anywhere in the world other than central america well there's a lot of like the majority of cacao comes from west africa like cote d'ivoire ghana um there's some that comes from like ecuador and peru also and like tanzania but that's where most of it comes from now, I guess there's a big child trafficking, child labor problem in West Africa with the ch chocolate plantations. Um, it's an issue that the government kind of has been overlooking. Wow. Yeah. Um, if anyone online wants to ask questions, you can unmute, but you can also type questions into the chat. And then local audience. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to bring some chocolate in front of the camera to show it? I can do it. Oliver, how do you make chocolate? Here's a close up for all you people at home. Oh, I've seen it. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. With a lot of stuff. Um, the ones that are like just dark chocolate is basically the same, but they have like some additives like soy lecithin or whatever to just like make it last longer. And then like milk chocolate, a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. It is dairy free. It is dairy free. Yeah. Vegan. Yes, thank you. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I, uh, I think it would be a lot easier the second time around. Also, in the summer, it would probably be easier for fermenting at least. I think it was an enjoyable process. Would I do it again? Maybe ask me a few weeks. <laughs> Yes, Millie? Um, how long did it take you to start? For, For the, the final, final um, bars, probably, let's see. I think, I, think I, started I started the fermenting in the middle of April, second week of April, and I was done first week of May. So a little less than a month. It took a while. Yeah. <laughs> I probably could have done it faster if it was the only thing I was focusing on. Oliver, I remember you were also working on the idea of product design. Mm -hmm. How did that go? Well, I didn't really have time to do any of the packaging. Um, yeah, I kind of just focused on other stuff. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. They're, they're easy to open. open. Well, yeah, yeah. you just kind of yeah. hack at it with a knife. Like, normally you use a machete. It didn't take, like, multiple things. Um, like, maybe the outside of a papaya 
or a little bit harder than that. Like not as like rock solid as a coconut, but like they're definitely hard. Yeah, you just kind of had to, I don't know, <laughs> whack it around it and then you could crack it open. It wasn't too difficult. So these are the pods here, the red. Yeah. 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 And so you cut this with a with a knife or? Yeah. Interesting. I just cut it like, like um, I don't know, once on either side and then they would crack open. And then those yeah. beans were like in a big string in the middle and I had to pull them off like, a, I don't know, there was another string coming out of one of the ends. Right. Yeah. So they had like a strand holding them together. Yeah. So how many pods did you buy? Um, I just got like the cheapest box from the place. I think it was just those five pods. And that ended up being almost enough. I think we needed to supplement a few more nibs from the store in order to reach the minimum capacity of the refiner. And so, how much do pods go for? Um, I think five of those were like $70. So they were pretty expensive, but they also came from Ecuador. So um, yeah, I think a lot of that was, I mean, there's a fair amount of shipping cost in there too. All right, cool. Audience, any more questions? Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was actually, well, I'll, I'll tell a little story. So I found a cheaper, much cheaper one online, but that one came from China. So I waited for it to come, did my research, did some tempering stuff, and um, that actually never arrived. <laughs> so like something else came instead. And so I emailed them and I got a refund, but I was not allowed to wait again from China. So I got one from Amazon for like, it was expensive, it was like $300. But I'm, I'm reselling that because I only used it twice. And I, I don't know, I'm probably not going to use it again, at least soon. So I can resell it. And I think that people will buy that. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, did you go? Everyone, thank, thank you all for this way. Thank you. friends come by i don't know if everyone will have delicious snacks for you for their presentation but you never know it's true. okay